another aspect is um and what you're developing here is um certainly has to do with uh, nature and grace and that's a big feature of Thomas Aquinas's uh, theology and philosophy and thinking of creation and how creation as created relates to God's supernatural purposes and so um the issue here um this gets at the heart of matters uh, of a lot of differences between different theological traditions And uh, you start to speak about the relationship between nature and grace. I think it's in a helpful way. And uh, specifically how that might pertain to the image of God and and how that pertains to eschatology and uh, creation's own telos. Uh, Would you say that creation had both various subordinate ends inherent to its ongoing existence and also to an an ultimate eschatological end? And that got me excited because I do believe in eschatology precedes soteriology. It's a very Vossian thing. I've got a portrait of Voss, the one that's on the cover of uh, Danny's Voss book to my left. Um, And so... For those who may not know, um, basically what we what we mean is that when God created Adam and Eve in His image and placed them in the garden, He had a plan and purpose for them that they would advance to a higher, glorious, and consummate life. That wasn't an appendage; that was an original intent. And then He was given this promise uh, originally in the covenant of works. You develop this in your in your conference lecture, and then He forfeited that by disobeying the Lord. So there's a question among different theologians, Thomas being one, how does nature relate to grace? What are the different, they're they're little short formulations. Grace preserves nature. Grace restores nature. Grace destroys nature. (laughs) What are this? How do you uh, perceive matters and what what is your corrective to maybe some misperceptions of the past? Yeah, well, the... uh... The two primary phrases that I interact with are uh, grace perfects nature, which is the way Thomas Aquinas put it. And there are also a lot of early Reformed theologians who, who, who put it in the same way. Uh, a lot of contemporary uh, neo-Calvinists pre- pre- prefer the terminology of uh, grace restores nature. And I, I mean, I think you, can, you could use either of those terms to say something theologically correct. Mm-hmm. But, you know, my... if I guess if I have something to to add to the discussion, it's in my suggestion that maybe we should use two verbs rather than one verb. And I think I think one of the one of the difficulties is, is in trying to find one verb that describes what grace does to nature, is that we lose the idea that actually we we talk about two kinds of God's grace or two aspects of God's grace: God's common grace and God's saving or special grace. And so I, I propose that we, we might say that common grace preserves nature while saving grace or special grace consummates nature. And what I mean by that is, is very similar to what we were talking about with, with our covenant theology earlier, mm-hmm. that um, by God's common grace, he, he preserves this, this, this world. Mm-hmm. Uh, this world is fallen. It's not what it was originally created as is a fallen world but god preserves it with with many good things um but god is also doing a much greater work and he is bringing redemption and that that gracious salvific grace is ultimately going to result in the consummation of this present world god is bringing this first creation to consummation in a new creation and so i think it's important that as we use this terminology of grace X nature, whatever that X, whatever verb that is, I think we need we need to account for for both of, of those things. I think for I think for Thomas uh, and for a lot of the Roman Catholic tradition, there's this tendency to have too low a view of 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 nature, even from the beginning. Yeah, that somehow there needed to be some supernatural grace that would take away the flaws of the, the original creation. The donum super right. right? And I think I think a danger in some of contemporary neo Calvinism um, is to uh, maybe not appreciate what kind of a radical work God needs to do to redeem this present world. And there's a, 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 a there's a danger of thinking that by our own our own transformative efforts in culture that we can mm-hmm. kind of bring the present world. Towards its 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 uh, 
new creation goal. So I, I sort of hope that that my new formula might like it. might provide yeah. a sort of a a new way to talk and debate this. Let's uh, let me go off book for a second. Yeah. But uh, um, with all Christian uh, brotherly charity, let me run an idea by you, see what you think. Um. So uh, Thomas, just if we look at the motto, grace perfects nature, I can go along with that and with a certain understanding, yeah. but then understanding, as you indicate, other aspects of Thomas's theology, which I'm tremendously appreciative of Thomas on the whole. Um, but when we're looking specifically at Adam as created in the garden, Adam was not created, so his nature was not, I should put it this way, insufficient for attaining attaining the beatific vision. So as Reformed people, um, please push back and correct me uh, if you feel the need to do so. But in, within the Reformed tradition and within Reformed anthropology, Adam was created in the image of God. I very much like Klein, who believes that the image of God has three aspects. It's formal slash physical. So even his body is imaging God. The image of God isn't just something that Adam does. It's something he is. Um, there's a functional aspect, that's the office, prophet, priest, and king, but there's also the ethical aspect. But as he was created, he was not created consummately. He was created good, but not perfected. Nevertheless, he had all that he needed in order to attain that which God held out to him. So God gave him the command in the covenant of works, but he wasn't lacking the equipment to obey. Now, obviously, he was mutable, and he didn't obey. One of the great mysteries of, you know, how did, why did he fall? You know, if he was created good, that's a mystery to some degree. Um, but he, it wasn't as if he needed the donum super additum in order to be directed toward that consummation. And so from that perspective, we can look at something that Gerhardus Voss calls the deeper Protestant conception. It's that inherent eschatology, a heavenly directedness, that there's an eschatology, a telos, built into nature, understood in terms of human nature. Would you, I mean, would you agree with that? So I far? would agree yeah. with that. Praise yeah. the Lord. Yeah. yeah, that's right. And I've... Yeah, I don't talk about that too much in That's this book. That's not this book. book. That's why I said we're uh, going off book. Yeah, there's definitely <laughs> there's definitely material on that in Divine Covenants and Moral yes. Order. Um, so yeah, I mean, I I I I would argue that the the image of God as we see it, particularly in Genesis one and two, at, of course we're going to need we want to think about more scripture than just Genesis one and two for our theology of the image. But and it, nine six, you do bring up in here. Oh yeah, def, yeah, definitely. Referencing man's capability of executing justice yeah. in the common kingdom. But I think it's very interesting right. that we see. I mean, God's own pattern yeah. in creating is to work in this world and then enter this eschatological rest, mm -hmm. and then He makes us in His image and immediately calls us to work in this world. Mm -hmm. Now, okay, we're in His image, we're in His likeness. He works in this world unto a rest. Well, if he makes us in his image and likeness called to work in this world, it's it must be with a goal. It it it, it must be with an end in sight. I mean, right. it, it it's not to an endless task right. of just working, working, working forever and ever and ever in this world and not getting anywhere. Right. And um, so I I think there's well, I mean, we could talk about this for a yeah. long time, but 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 I do think that that in the image of God itself there is that that eschatological goal. And I think it's great. I mean, I just, it, it, how can you not think of 1 Corinthians 15? Right? I was just I mean, going mean, to bring it up. As we have, we have borne the image of the man of dust, so we will bear the image of the man of heaven. And, you know, there's, I think there's a real sense, I, I you know, this is not necessarily the, the, the most accessible way to put it. Um, but I do suggest uh, to my students that it's it, it helpful to distinguish the protological image and the eschatological image. Well, that's what I would say. And I that, don't know if you would agree, but I certainly see the comparison there, not between fallen Adam and Christ, but between Adam as created and yeah, Christ. Yeah, but then he I says, right. if the natural, Paul says, if there is the natural, then also the spiritual, which seems to indicate that there is an inherent eschatology, a drivenness of and a directedness of that image of God as created that is that is inevitably pointed to pointing toward the the resurrection that's right and, and the, the way i would put it is that this this protological yes. image uh we are made to be workers yeah. toward arrest right 
And then the eschatological image, which Christ already has as right. the resurrected and ascended one, is, I mean, he, he's no longer a worker toward a rest. He is, you might say, he's a rester looking back at yeah. the work completed. Be and, seated. And then in him, mm -hmm. we we uh, we already have mm -hmm. uh, a, a share in that. And mm -hmm. at our resurrection, we will we'll share it fully.